Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the assurance you are giving us that you are with us. And even though the world may judge us as poor, in reality we are rich. And we pray, O Lord, you open our eyes to see the riches of the kingdom belonging to every one of your children. And we pray, O Lord, as all our needs we find in Christ fulfilled, we are praying, O Lord, you help us to see more of Christ so that we'll be everything we ought to be and we'll live in life with all the sufficiency of the kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We welcome everyone to our Bible study today in Jesus' name. We're very happy that you are here, and we're praying that your coming will not be in vain in Jesus' name. We're being in the epistle of James, that's the general epistle of James, and we've just gone through chapter 1. We're now in chapter 2. As we have been studying, there is one thing we learned, that James was concerned about the life of the brethren. That is, the people who have known the Lord, and he wants us, the brethren, to know what it means to be a child of God. And then to test our Christian experience, to see whether it is real or it is not real. You'll find, as we look at chapter 2, verse 1, it begins by saying, My brethren. Before we go on, let's look at those words, my brethren. And what I want you to understand is that from the very beginning of the epistle to the very last paragraph of the epistle, he tells us he's addressing the people who are called by the name of the Lord. Look at chapter 1 verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse, different, various temptations. He's talking to the brethren. Chapter 1 verse 16. It says, do not err, do not go astray in your thinking, in your mind, in your understanding, my beloved brethren. And then in chapter 2 verse 1, which we have read already, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with respect of persons. In chapter 3 verse 1, my brethren, he says, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Verse 10, out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, he comes on once again talking to the children of God. These things ought not so to be. In verse 12, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear only berries, either a vine figs, so can no fountain but yield salt water and fresh. You see that in every chapter, he stops to remind us that he's addressing the epistle to those who are born again, to those who are members of the family of God, to those who are brethren in Christ. In chapter 4 verse 11, speak not evil, one of another brethren. And then in chapter 5 verse 9, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. In verse 10, it says, Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction or, and of patience. And then in verse 19 and verse 20, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Do you see that in every chapter? is very careful to remind us he's talking to the brethren. If you are a brother, if you are a sister in Christ here tonight, the epistle has a special message for you and for me as well. What have we learned in chapter 1? Actually, in chapter 1, he has given us a lot of ways to test how genuine our salvation is. Who is the true brother? 
who is the true sister, he then gives you the test by which you will know who a genuine child of God is. Actually, he's calling not to self-examination. He says, come into this epistle and start from the very first verse to the, to the last verse and test the profession of your faith, of your salvation. Is it real? Is it false? What has he been talking about? He has already spoken about patience. How patient are you? In your trials, in your temptation, in your difficulty, are you patient? Number two, he talks about perseverance in our trials, our tests, and temptations. Number three, he's talking about joy and dependence on the Lord, even in our low estate. And then number four, he tells us the origin and the source of temptation. Number five, about submission to and obedience to the word of God. Number six, he's talking about love for the poor and support for the needy. Number seven, the control of the tongue. Number eight, separation from the evil in the world. He's saying you can test yourself. On the basis of all these things he has mentioned in chapter 1 To see whether you are for real or you are not Today's study brings us into another important and practical issue And the issue we are dealing with today is important for the individual Christian As well as for the whole church He wants us to know, are you a real Christian? He says, I'm going to be able to tell by the test on partiality or favoritism Actually today we are talking about the peril of partiality in the church Or the evil of favoritism in the church Look at it from verse 1 now. It says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. As we look at the 13 verses we are going to study today, we are dividing the study into three parts. Number one, respect of persons condemned. That means partiality or favoritism, respect of persons condemned. Number two, the riches of poor Christians. The people will look at, or the world will look at, and say they are poor, want to see the riches of poor Christians. And then number three, the royal law practiced by Christians. The royal law practiced by Christians. Number one, respect of persons Condemned. As we talk about respect of persons, that phrase means favoritism or partiality. And the word of God is very, very clear about it, that that kind of attitude or behavior is condemned very seriously in the word of God. From verse 1 again, my brethren, children of God, Members of the family of God do not have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if they are come unto your assembly, into the church worship or meeting, a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile, poor, shabby raiment. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? You will see in the word of God that if you are a child of God, there is something the Lord is going to remove from your life. That is favoritism, partiality, or respect of persons. Why? Because if you look at the nature of God, God is completely impartial. And in fact, we are told about that in both the Old and the New Testament concerning the nature of God. Almost everybody talked about it. The very fact that God had no favorites. He deals with everyone in a very fair way and he will not show respect of persons. In Second Chronicles chapter 19. Second Chronicles chapter 19 verse 7. Wherefore now, 
Let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. What we learn about God the Father is that there is no respect of persons with him. And this is exactly what Peter also said when he came to the house of Cornelius. The Lord had shown him that he accepted both the Jew and the Gentile. And when Peter came to the house of Cornelius, look at it in Acts chapter 10 verse 34 here is what he said then peter opened his mouth and said of a truth i perceive that god is no respecter of persons what james is telling us then is saying my brethren are you a child of god have your sins been forgiven are you a member of the family of god look at the nature of god Look at the attribute of God. God is impartial. And if you have the nature of God, and you have that same characteristic, you are going to be impartial. You will not have any respect of persons to the point that you are going to prefer the rich to the poor. And then you think about the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ, they recognized one fact, that Jesus had that same nature attribute characteristic of the almighty god that he didn't have respect of persons in matthew chapter 22 matthew chapter 22 verse 16 and they sent out unto him their disciples with the herodians saying master we know that thou art true and teachest the way of god in truth neither carest thou for any man for thou regardest not the persons of men. Even the enemies, even the persecutors, they pointed out the same thing concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. That he didn't have partiality or favoritism. He wasn't a respecter of persons. In the sense that he will be favoring somebody against the other one. Or applying different standards to different people. In um, Romans chapter 2. We're told about the actions of God. If you consider the actions of God concerning salvation, He wants to save everyone on the same condition, on the same terms. Concerning judgment, He judges everyone on the same condition, on the same term. Concerning usefulness, He makes use of everyone that will fulfill the qualification or the prerequisite. If there is no partiality with Him, there is no respect of persons with him in romans chapter 2 romans chapter 2 verse 9 tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil whether it's a jew or a gentile of the jew force and also of the gentiles no respect of persons but stand but glory and honor and peace unto every man that walketh good to the Jew force and also to the Greek. And here comes verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. What the word of God then is telling us is that if we are children of God, if we are followers of Christ, that same characteristic in Christ, in God, must be found in us as well. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we are called to be like God and to be impartial. There is no place for favoritism in the heart of God. And there is no place for favoritism in the life of any of the children of God and in the church as well to show favoritism is to allow yourself to be unduly influenced by someone's social status by his prestige or by power or by his wealth and then you'll be different very different from christ and you will offend god if you have partiality of judgment or you have favoritism in the way you treat people in the church or people outside then that thing is condemned as sin let's look at leviticus and see how the word of god tells us over and over again that there should not be favoritism in the christian life and there should not be favoritism in the church you will not favor somebody because it's from your tribe 
You will not favor somebody because it's a foreign to you. You'll be truthful. You'll be faithful. You'll be fair to everyone. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 15. Leviticus 19 verse 15. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shall thou judge thy neighbor. It's telling us that in our behavior, in our relationship, one to the other, we're going to be fair, we're not going to be partial, we're going to do everything on an equal basis. We'll not say, well, because uh, that fellow is rich, even though he doesn't manifest the Christian character, we're going to give him responsibility. We're going to favor him because of his riches. We're not going to say because that man is poor, but uh, even though he's saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, and is knowledgeable in the Word of God, we cannot make use of him because he is poor. We will not exalt, we will not uh, lift up the, uh, the rich man above the poor man. We deal with everyone on the basis of their character, on the basis of their Christian experience. There will be no tribalism and there will be no partiality in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 17. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment but ye shall hear the small as well as the great do you see in many churches there is too much of classification that one is rich that one is poor that one is educated that one is illiterate that one is refined in culture and that one is uh, not very social and they deal with those people in different ways but here is telling us whether they are small or they are great whether they are poor or they are rich, whether they are men or they are women, you will apply the same yardstick, the same standard of the word of God. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for judgment, the judgment is God's, and the cause that is too hard for you, bring it to me that I may hear it. If we are then children of God, there will be no favoritism. Think about it now in your house fellowship. Think about it in your zone, in your district, in your local church, your district church. How do we deal with people? Are we so partial? Are we applying different standards? Do you apply a different standard to your relative and then a different standard to those who are not your relatives even though they are members of the church the Bible says there should be no respect of persons Proverbs chapter 24 Proverbs chapter 24 verse 23 these things also belong to the wise it is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. You will not look at their social status, at their education, at the kind of clothes they are wearing, at the kind of car they are riding in, and at the kind of a house they are living in before you pass the judgment or before you make the comment. Whatever they have, whatever they don't have, you'll keep faithful and true to the word of God. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 21. 28, 21, to have respect of persons is not good. For, for a piece of bread, that man will transgress. That is, he's saying the people that are partial because of a loaf of bread. Because somebody has been giving you something that has closed your eyes now, that you are not acting the way you ought to act. And here is how we distinguish a real biblical church and a worldly church. Here is how we make a difference between a church that is standing firm on the word of God and a church that is just like a society. And we should be examining our church, this church, examine our church and say, how are we behaving? How are we treating people? Are we treating people on the basis of the word of God? Do we discipline people on the basis of the word of God? Do we give them chance to be useful in the church on the basis of the word of God? Or is it because I oh, is my relative? 
because he's my relative, whether he's qualified or not, he must be useful, he must do something in the church. Of course, she's my wife. And because she's my wife, she must do something in the church, whether she's spiritual or not spiritual. That's not right. We shouldn't do that. We should base everything on the word of God. We should do nothing by partiality. In First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5. Verse 21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. You see that? Doing nothing by partiality. If that is the word of God, that's what we ought to stand by. Because remember once again, that's the character of God. That's the nature of God. There's no partiality in him. There's no favoritism in him. And remember that's the attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we're children of God, because we're followers of Christ, we ought to behave like God and behave like Christ. Once again, we're told about God in Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34, verse 19. Job 34, 19. How much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. You see that Almighty God in heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ too, they do not regard the person of the rich more than the poor. How is it with you? How is it in your own Christian life? How is it in our own church? Can we be accusing this church, in our church, that now favoritism is the order of the day, partiality is the order of the day, we are no more like God, we are no more doing what the Lord expects us to do, to just be fair to everyone without any partiality. If we are showing partiality or favoritism, look at the conclusion of uh, the Bible in James chapter 2, in verse Verse 9. James chapter 2, verse 9. But if ye have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. If we do not apply the same yardstick, the same standard, the same scripture uh, to everyone, and then we are doing favoritism, partiality, then we are transgressing, and now we are sinners. And then it brings a practical example. It brings a practical example of uh, two men, one coming to the church and is rich. The, both of them are not Christians, they are just visiting the church. If you look at it in verse 2, for if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring, not a believer, not a child of God, but he just came to worship of the church and he came all dressed up elegantly and with a golden ring in the hand. And then another one comes at that same time to the church church, a poor man, and he has a shabby clothes on, and then you tell the rich man, you sit in a very good place, and then you tell that poor man, sit under my footstool or beside my footstool here, are you then not judges of evil conscience? It's telling us in everything that whether we're dealing with visitors or we're dealing with members of the church, let's make sure we have the characteristics of the Lord that we will not show partiality. If we have been showing partiality, we need to repent and tell the Lord that we know that is wrong, that's a sin, and if we die in that condition, the Lord will not be happy with us. Now we go to point number two. The riches of poor Christians. In verse 5, Hacking my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him? Now he is talking about the poor people in particular. And he now wants to tell us the special place God has for the people who have believed on the Lord. And they were poor. I want you to understand that in the early church, there were many, many poor people in the church. But they came to know the Lord. 
God, they were born again. That's not surprising. In fact, in the very first message that Jesus Christ himself preached in the synagogue, do you know where he read? Look at it in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. You will see that he had gospel for the poor. He had his heart for the poor, his grace for the poor, his salvation and deliverance for the poor. In Luke chapter 4 verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. You will see then the special place, the poor had in the heart of God, anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Another time, John the Baptist sent his disciples. And he wanted to know, are you the one to come, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the Savior, or are we to look for another? What evidence did Jesus say they should take back to, the, uh, to John the Baptist? That's in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, and in verse 5. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. He said, this is the way he will know that I'm the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the savior of the world. The poor people have the gospel preached unto them. In fact, another time, he encouraged the poor people that they shouldn't feel they are miserable. In fact, theirs was the king of God in Luke chapter 6 verse 20 Luke chapter 6 verse 20 and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said blessed are ye poor for yours is the kingdom of God why did he say the gospel was made available to the poor why did he say that the gospel was being preached to the poor why did he say that the poor should rejoice because theirs was a kingdom of god because you know those poor people they knew they were already miserable here on earth and that made them to be able to approach the lord and believe on the lord repent of their sins and then be born again and then the inheritance of the kingdom of god the riches of the kingdom now became theirs and even after jesus had died and the church had been established here is what Paul the apostle told the believers there are a lot of poor poor people in the church and they didn't regret because of that in fact they rejoiced because they knew that those poor people they are the riches of the kingdom awaiting them first Corinthians chapter 1 first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 for you see your calling brethren how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. You will see then that in the early church, the poor people just flocked into the church. The poor people received the word of God. And many of them accepted the Lord. Jesus Christ and they were born again and there's something wonderful about the early church the early church did not lower the standard for the rich people they didn't say we need these rich people to come we need these educated people to come these highly placed people we need them to come and if we're going to make them to come we must lower the standard that again will be respect of persons that again will be favoritism and partiality and of course you'll be deceiving them because half gospel partial gospel will not save anybody but they preach the same word of god to everyone and many Many of those people who were poor, they came in and they were born again. Were they rich? Oh yes, they were rich. Although they were poor physically and materially. First Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. He said, not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise men are called. God has chosen the foolish, poor things of the world to confound the mighty. But he said, there's nothing to care about in that. All things are yours. Then he said, whether Paul or Apollos or Sebas or the world, the good things in the world, or life, good things in life, or death, even the death of Christ, the greatest death, 
death, bringing atonement to us, or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. He's telling these poor people who have come to know the Lord, he said, everything belongs to you. Christ belongs to you. The life of Christ belongs to you. The death of Christ belongs to you. Even Paul, even Apollos, everything belongs to you. Therefore, though you are poor in the physical, in the material, in the reality, you are rich. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For all things are for your sakes. You see that? He had told them you are not mighty. He had told them you are not wise. He had told them you are not noble. In other words, you are poor. We know that. But then all things are for your sakes. That the abundance, the abundant grace might uh, through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Now in chapter 6, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. As sorrowful, yet rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. That's why he was telling those believers, although some rich people, a few rich people came into the church, you shouldn't think that everybody in the church was poor actually. You, do you remember Theophilus that uh, Luke wrote to? Most excellent Theophilus. He was rich. Do you remember Nicodemus? He was rich also. And do you remember Barnabas? He even sold what he had. He had possession of land. He sold it. That man was rich. Even in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, many of them them that had possessions of land, they sold it. Some of them were actually rich. And then we're told in Acts chapter 17, in verse 11 and verse 12, some rich people actually came into the church. But what we are being told is that although the majority are poor and the minority rich, there should be no difference in dealing with them. There should be no favoritism. Deal with the poor, deal with the rich on an equal basis because they are saved by the same grace. They have the same salvation. They are going to the same heaven. We are in the church and the kingdom of God. No partiality, no difference between us. Acts chapter 17 verses 11 and 12. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and said the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men not a few. So you will see that some rich people also came to the church. But to see those rich people that came to the church, they were giving to the word of God, they were faithful, they were honorable, they were beaten, they were consecrated. That's why they were accepted as members of the church. If they had not been humble, if they had not been faithful, if they were not obedient to the word of God, and if they were not consecrated, they would not have been accepted as part of the church. Let's learn a lesson from that today. When people come to the church, if they are poor, accept them. When people come to the church, if they are rich and they are willing to obey the word of God, and they are willing to repent, they are willing to make their restitutions, they are willing to walk according to the same word of God. They are not looking for a watered down gospel. They are not looking for a different standard. They are not grumbling against the word of God. They are not rejecting the word of God. You will accept them just like you accept those other people that are poor in the church. Everyone on an equal basis. We'll come back to James chapter 2. James chapter 2 now from verse 6, but ye have despised the poor. Unfortunately for these Christians that James was writing to, he said, you are different from God. You are different from Christ. Christ will not despise the poor. And God will not despise the poor. But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. You see, some of the rich men they accepted, they didn't submit to the word of God. And therefore, they were even bringing oppression on the poor people who were children of God. And then it says in verse 7, Do they not blaspheme the word in name by which you are called, eh, by their character, by their attitude? Are they not making people to blaspheme and saying, Well, that's a member of your church, and is oppressing us, 
he will not uh, pay us, uh, we work for him, he will not pay us, and he's an important member of your church. You see, they make the people blaspheme the name of the Lord. If we will repent and tell the Lord, we're very, very sorry for the partiality we have shown, if we have shown partiality, and come back to the word of God and behave the same way to everyone, the way we ought to behave, the blessing of the Lord will be upon us and will be upon the church in Jesus' name. Now we go to point number three, the royal law practiced by Christians. Now he tells us the way we ought to behave and he tells us whether the person is rich or poor. Here is the law that should govern us and control us, control our action. In um, James chapter 2 verse 8, And if ye fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. Let's stop there for a moment. If ye fulfill the royal law. What's the royal law? When we talk about a royal family, we are talking about the prince, we are talking about the king, and we are talking about a kingly family. Don't you know that's how the Bible refers to us if we are children of God? Look at First Peter chapter 2 verse 9. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has called us out of darkness. We have repented. We are no more the people we used to be. We have come into Christ. We have come into the light. We are new creatures in Christ. Because he is king. His family is a royal family. Therefore, we are now a chosen generation. And then we are a royal priesthood. Because we belong to the royal family, you must fulfill the royal law. Actually, what that means is that because he is a king, he is giving us a law from the king by which we ought to behave. And that law coming from the king is referred to as the royal law. Not only that, if we obey that word and we live by that principle, we will please the king. That's why it calls it the royal law. And it even makes us king ourselves. And then we live in such a way that the, the Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, will find nothing to condemn in our lives. What's the royal law? Look at verse 8 again. If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. That is, you see that man, is a poor man, is your neighbor. Love him just as yourself. You see that rich man, is your neighbor. Love him as yourself. You see him is educated. You see him is not educated. Love him as yourself. You see him, he might look appear, he might appear unfortunate in life. Love him as yourself. There should be no partiality. That's the point. See everyone the way the Lord is seeing them. You see born again, but then although he's born again, he's poor. Love him just like yourself. If you will go by that law, then he says you do well because you are behaving as Christ himself would have behaved. Love your neighbor, love your brother, love your sister, whatever their social status, whatever their lack of education, or whatever it may be, they are rich, they are poor, count them as your neighbors and just love them the same. Leviticus chapter 19. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Leviticus 19, 18, telling us about this royal law, about our behavior to our neighbor, without looking at whether they are rich or poor, without showing favoritism in any way. Chapter 19, verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then it says, I am the Lord. If you say that I am your Lord, if you say that you are born again and you are a member of the family of God, here is the royal law. Here is the law coming from the king himself. You will love your neighbor as yourself without any consideration for their physical outlook, physical appearance, or their material possession. In that same chapter, verse 34, 
But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you. It says whether the person is from your tribe or not, you will behave in the same way to him. You count him as a stranger, you count him as a foreigner, because he's not from your tribe. You will behave to him as one born among you. And thou shalt love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. Again, he ends it by saying, I am the Lord your God. And if you really belong to me and you have been born again, here is the way you are going to behave. You are not going to be tribalistic in your outlook in anything you do. You are going to just serve me as I expect you to serve me. Jesus referred to this as uh, one of the two great laws of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 39. Matthew twenty-two, twenty-nine, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor, hang all the law and the prophets. And so then you understand the royal law. You are to behave, you are to love without any preferential treatment. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 12, it's now the golden rule. The royal law is the golden rule, the same thing. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 12, therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. You see somebody in your district, your locality, your community. You see a poor man, behave to him the way you want him to behave to you if you are the poor man. Uh, she having some need in her life, behave to her the way you will want her to behave to you if you were in her position. All things whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do to them likewise also. Before you say anything about anybody, think about it. Would I like them to say this about me? Before you do anything to anybody, think about it. Would I want people to do this against me? Whatever you don't want others to do against you don't do against them you don't want people to discriminate against you because of the color of your skin or because of the kind of clothes you are wearing or because you don't have enough education or because you don't have this position or that title you don't want anybody to misbehave to you in the same way you will not misbehave to anybody because of their tribe because of their social position because of their poverty or for any reason whatsoever let the love of God reign in your heart and reign in the church and reign in our midst in First Thessalonians chapter 3 First Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 12 and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another and toward all men, even as we do towards you. You can see that verse is very full. The Lord make you to abound and to increase, to increase in love. In your relationship with people, grow in love. In your attitude to them, in uh, behavior to them, grow in love. Let it abound one to another. That's within the church. Now he says towards all men, and then he says, even as we do towards you. Let's come back to James chapter 2. In James chapter 2 verse 8, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, ye shall love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. But if on the other hand you don't go by the royal law, if on the other hand you are not going by the golden rule, if on the other hand you misbehave, and you practice favoritism, partiality, respect of persons. If ye have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. He's saying no matter how we profess to be sanctified, 
how we profess to be holy and we say this is a bible church if we're doing everything all right but favoritism comes into the church partiality comes into the church preferential treatment comes into the church then we become guilty of all in verse 11 for he that says do not commit adultery said also do not kill now if thou commit no adultery and yet if thou kill and thou thou art become a transgressor of the law if you are all right on one point and you believe one side of the doctrine but then tribalism will not leave you alone favoritism will not leave you alone you will support a relative who has done wrong and you will defend that relative that has done wrong even though you know that the fellow is wrong then it means so I transgress all. You are no more a real child of God. He says, so speak in verse 12. And so do as they that will be judged by the law of liberty. For ye shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. For mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Today the Lord has taught us this word on um, not having respect of persons, not allowing partiality, not allowing favoritism, and we need to measure our lives This is how we know whether we are for real or not Whether we are real children of God or not Is your life controlled by love? Are you, or are you partial? Or are you showing favoritism? Is the love of God in your heart? Do you have the characteristic of God the Father? Do you have the characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ? Even the people that are not Christians, can they come to you? Like they came to Christ and they said, We know you are teaching the truth because we know that you do not have partiality, favoritism, or the respect of persons. The Lord is calling us to examine our lives and to bring everything under the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. Why don't you stand up and tell the Lord, reveal who you are to the Lord. If you have been showing favoritism, that's a great, great sin. It means you are different from God. It means you are different from Christ. If you have been showing partiality, if you have been showing tribalism in the church, the way responsibilities are given out, the way opportunities are given out, and the way we relate to people, and the way we help people, and the way we give whatever we want to give unto them to help them, if it is all on the basis of tribalism, favoritism, respect of persons, or you are favoring the rich above the poor, then you are still sinning. Come to the Lord and say, Lord, I am sorry. Cleanse me with the blood of the Lamb. Let there be a change in my life so that this attribute of impartiality will be in me as it was in Christ.